When I was a kid, my dad once took me on a trip to his favorite fishing hole. It's a place called Sparrow Lake. It's the most beautiful spot you've ever seen. Hi there, Jean-Philippe. How are you? Congratulations on winning the 11th Second Club for August of 2021. Uh, my name is Dana Masson, and I am a freelance animator. Uh, I'm from uh, uh, Toronto, Canada, originally. I am currently living near Boston, Massachusetts, um, and uh, I've kind of had a I've had an interesting career, uh, um, sort of working at different studios all over the place in Toronto and New York, and even in India. Um, and on just about every type of project you could think of for animating. I've worked in games, television, commercials, feature film, uh, DVD movies, uh, and even um, uh, fine art uh, installation display work. Um, so there's been a, a lot of really cool things that I've gotten to do in my time as an animator. And I've been um, a, a mentor for Animation Mentor for 14 and a half years, I think it is now. So um, it's been a long and fun uh, gig to have um, at the same time as doing all my animation work. So it is very nice for me to be able to have a look at your work today and give you some feedback. Um, First of all, I just want to say that I love the tone of the animation that you did. It suits the the uh, audio of the dialogue very well. Um, you have that sense of kind of those uh, insurance commercials that you see where they kind of have people trying to look casual and <laughs> and um, uh, talking about uh sort of their life and how it pertains to what it is that they're selling kind of thing. Um, so this really has that same kind of flavor where it's uh, meant to look very spontaneous and um, sort of documentary, like where the uh, you're just sort of following the person doing um their natural things. So the way that you put this together with the camera following the, the person around in uh, a very handheld kind of uh, feel works really well to um, give it that that same sense of spontaneity. Um, so let me just start with um, the nice things about the camera first, since actually, let me play it through first once so that everybody can who's watching the Ecrit can um, see it through the entire thing. And then I'll get into details. Awesome. Okay. So, um, without having the sound on just so that, um, I can let it loop and keep talking without it being, um, too much for you guys to listen to. So there's just a really slight follow, um, with the camera. It's very, the moves are very smooth. It's not, um, a feeling of it being forced in any way. Um, it's definitely following what the character's doing as if there's somebody standing there with the camera following the action that um, doesn't know what's happening next. So that's the, the documentary feel. Um, they did a, they created a system to do that in Surf's Up, that uh, animated movie with the penguins, the surfing penguins, uh, way back when. That was really um, a brand new kind of technology at the time. They uh, added... Uh, that they were able to run the animated scenes through the camera in a way that the person with the camera could turn around and look at what was happening in the 3D space as if they were in the middle of that action. So they would have some, they would have the animator get to a point in the, the shot that it was um, uh, done enough that somebody could come in and with a, and put the camera on and follow the scene um, and record the camera action that way. So certainly you didn't do that with this, but you did a really good job getting that matching kind of feel. But it's very hard to do without there being um, too much kind of digital feeling movement with the camera. So kudos to you on that because animating cameras is really hard. Um, but you did a really nice job following the action with the camera, even with the, you know, slight movement down when he's picking up the stone um, and uh, slightly moving the camera over as he throws the stone into the lake. 
Um, but keeping him still on, on camera as he's standing up there, he gets right up to the top of the screen. So you don't get the sense that the camera is leading. Um, there is a downward movement that the character is doing right on the cut. Um, that is a really nice carryover from one camera to the next camera that makes it flow really well. But there's also a slight down movement on the camera as he's dropping on that big exhale um, that continues into the, the next camera when it's the uh, closer shot. So that transition from one, one shot to the next shot where the cut is feels so smooth. And getting that kind of continuity over with movement over the cut is also very difficult. And um, you did it really, really well. So the next thing I can talk about is uh, the body mechanics. So he starts off down on a crouched position. And he's talking to the camera, kind of looking up. Um, the pose is really nice to the camera. It's really nice and clear. Um, the silhouette's nice and clear. Even though we're looking from above and he's kind of crouched down, there's still enough detail in, in like where the joints are bent and you can still kind of see where the bending of the foot is and that he's clearly on the ball of his foot, like all that stuff. Um, could have gotten easily lost, but you did a really good job of keeping it in a clear uh, silhouette so that we could be able to get a, a close sense of how he's sitting. Um, as he's standing up, I really like what you're, the, the subtlety of what you're doing in the foot down there with the, the heel coming down as he's shifting his weight to stand up. And there's a nice unfolding of the body and torso. So his upper body is staying in more of a contracted state on the way up until his legs are getting into a straighter position. I think that you probably could have had a tiny bit more, uh, a tiny bit of overlap in, in the head on the way up. So like, you know, at the top of the action, um, you know, here, but we, where he still has a little while to uh, sort of finish that upward movement. If he still had his chin down a bit lower so that when he stood up, he could make the head sort of be the last thing that comes up, um, that would kind of finish off that overlap as well. I like the little toss. I wonder if maybe just moving the shoulder up a little bit leading into that would also um, help with, uh, keeping that connection of the arm with the torso. And certainly, you know, you do have the toss, um, kind of happening right on the heels of him standing up. Um, and if you did started the toss a tiny bit earlier, you could actually get the toss working in conjunction with the upward motion. So the upward motion of the hips can lead into um, the upward motion of the toss. And then you would have the whole body, including the lower body, even in a small way would be engaged in that little gesture. So it's a little bit separated from the body, but it wouldn't take too much to really, um, get it joined in and connect it to the body, the entire body. And even the same when he catches it, if the timing is pretty good, the way he's catching it, um, and he lowers his arm as he's coming down. Uh, I would say that the down of the arm, the, the arm getting to its down position and the hips getting to its down position are a little close, right? It's a little on the nose. They hit at the same time. So um, if the hips were to lower first, and continue the arm coming down slightly afterwards and ha let the arm finish just after the hips finish, that also would be a way to connect that gesture on the catch to the rest of the body as well. Because there essentially there's already that opportunity to connect the two because the timing is very close. Um, but it would, if there's a little bit of overlap there, it will add just that little bit of extra texture um, and weight to the arm and, um, 
and weight to the stone as well. I know it's a little stone, but still. I do like the uh, bit of uh, overlap as he swings the arm back and you get the wrist overlap. That's really nice. And you did a really nice job with the arc on that too, the way he swings the arm back and then the arm comes out to the side and around for the skip. You did a really nice job with the arcs on that. It all feels very, um, very organic um, and flows really well. I love on the throw that you have that, that sort of elbow leading um, the throw. And certainly that's, you know, how you skip rocks. <laughs> As any rock skipper knows, that elbow kind of leads the action. Again, though, I would say that probably involving a little bit more of the shoulder on that. It, it comes forward with the arm, but allow it to come forward a tiny bit ahead of the arm. So it's the shoulder coming forward just slightly ahead of the elbow. And so you have like this whip action happening that goes from the shoulder to the elbow to the wrist. <sighs> And that will help to kind of have a, that'll give a really nice um, sense of um, the energy building from the core out to the end. And you'll get that little extra amount of energy uh, ending up in that flick of the wrist on the throw. And also a little bit of weight shift on that as well. So if the hips went sort of down, up, forward, even a small bit as he's doing the throw with the arm that, and a little bit of twist on the wrist, on the, uh, um, the hips as well. You have a little bit of rotation in the upper body, but the hips are staying really kind of in place. So if you start the rotation, let's go back here. So if you were to start the rotation and, and have a little bit of down up happening in the hips first, and then allow that twist to continue up the torso. So, um, you kind of have, uh, the arm, uh, lagging behind just a smidge, but you get the hips going first and then the middle spine and then the upper spine. And that's when the shoulder comes forward. Cause that's all attached up here. Right. And then the arm would do its, um, its arc following. And so you'd have that buildup of the, the twist from the core right out to the throw. And I love the uh, expression on the, the big inhale. You did a good job with that, the way that the chest sticks out and the shoulders come up uh, and the way that the, the head and the nose, the little details on that inhale are really nice too. The hand poses maybe could get, um, you could get a little more interesting with. I see that the thumb here is um, kind of just still in place. I think that you probably were just trying to hide it <laughs> inside the character's um, hip there, um, but it is noticeable, sorry. Um, and the uh, hand position is very evenly spaced as well. So even if you just like, because it's kind of sitting on the hip, if you just sort of even allowed for there to be a little overlap in the, the position, how it's sitting on there, like the fingers, like have, you know, one sitting more on top of the hip and then the next one a little bit more. And then the other ones are more kind of curled at the side, you know, that kind of thing. Um, just to get some variety in the finger pose and, um, make it feel a little bit more relaxed and natural. Uh, I love that you have some nice asymmetrical stuff going on in the face. It is uh, not an extremely exaggerated pose, but it doesn't need to be like, you know, this isn't a situation that calls for that. But you did a nice job of having this, you know, subtle squash on this side of the face and subtle stretch on this side of the face with this brow being up and, and the, uh, this eye and brow kind of being a little further down um, and this part of the uh, lip being further down. Um, something else that you could do to really push that a, a little more too would be to pull the chin this way a little bit so that it comes down, you know, with the center of it a little more over that way. Cause then you'd have a sense of this, um, line of action being down the middle of the face, having some curve to it. I'm just going to sort of clean that up a little bit. Um, and 
the great thing about this is like, if you look at uh, posing in the uh, body pose context, um, you know, really the main thing with body poses are the line of action um, and the line of the shoulder and the line of the hips, right? So that uh, the asymmetry, the action of uh, what the character's doing and how the hips and the shoulders are counterbalancing each other. So if you have the uh, pose with a line of action like that, and you've got your shoulder line like that, then your hip line would be contrasting. And you can do the same thing with facial poses as well. And you essentially have that going on here. Um, you even have the asymmetry in the mouth working that way, but it's just the jaw isn't also included in that, but you could do it. Uh, so the center of the jaw would be more over here so that that line of action follows through at the bottom. But you do have a nice sense of that contraposto between you know the eyes and the mouth as, as it would be with the shoulders and the hips um, and the line going down the center of the face with that curve as it would be with a line of action in the body. So that's really nice. Now going into the facial stuff, I love that kind of earnest expression, you know, where he's that, so, you know, <laughs> I think that reads really well. Um, it's perfect for the dialogue. He's got that sort of happy, earnest thing going on through the whole shot and i think it's the the perfect expression for what i'm hearing in the dialogue let's go back to hearing the dialogue for a moment when i was a kid my dad once took me on a trip to his favorite fishing hole it's a place called sparrow lake it's the most beautiful spot you've ever seen when I was a kid, my dad once took me on a trip to his favorite fishing hole. It's a place called Sparrow Lake. It's the most beautiful spot you've ever seen. So lip sync. So in the when I was a kid part. When I was a kid. Let's see, let me hear that again. When I was a kid. So when he's starting to say when I was at the beginning, his lips are closed. Um, it would be, it's all, usually, I mean, I guess the inhale could happen through the nose, but he's not, he really got a wo shape for the, when I was a kid and it doesn't need to be too extreme because he's not like, you know, Ooh, he's not like really enunciating hard, but, um, getting that pucker in there would really help to anchor that, uh, beginning of the sentence. When I was a kid, my dad once took me on a trip. My dad once took me. My dad once took me. I feel like if you had the mouth open in a neutral, and when I was a kid, because he's pausing there, but he's not done speaking. And as he's standing up, he might want to do an inhale um, because there's a physical action as well as because he it has a break in the sentence where he could say something, uh, having the mouth open slightly would really help a lot in terms of making the beginning of the next word, my show better, because then you would get the lips closed to start the beginning of the word, my, but you would see where that is because it would be new open in a neutral amount before that. So it kind of gets lost right now, even though it's technically there, you know what I mean? But, um, if it, because he's doing that physical movement at the same time, if he had the mouth neutrally open and then he started the word by closing his mouth first and then beginning the rest of the sentence, then you would see that a little bit better, uh, over that movement, you know? And when he says, dad, My dad wants you could and you could uh, exaggerate that open mouth shape for my dad because it's you can hear it. There's an enunciation in the way he's saying it. He's holding it for uh, a, a decent amount of time, um, and you can see the word. But I think that if you open the mouth more, it would express that you again. You know, he's he's kind of on the move, and we're a little bit far away. So I think that there's room for a little more exaggeration on that. And then when he goes from dad to once, my dad wants, you need to do more pucker for the, my dad wants, my dad wants. So there's got to be that, you know, um, pursed uh, shape to get that wh.
took me on a, and I think uh, when he's saying on it, took me on a, um, open the jaw a little bit more on the on a part, took me on a, so that you can see the vowel sound a little bit more. And when he says two to his favorite, um, on two, you're bringing the corners of the lips forward to, uh, to, his, to his, and when you get to his, you're pulling the corners back quite a bit. It's like into a grin almost. Um, if you kept them forward a little bit more, then it will flow better from two is into, into the next part favorite, because when you're saying favorite, um, you're bringing the, uh, the corners of the mouth forward for the, you know, not like a whole lot forward, but forward and then fave. And then when he gets to favorite, you know, the R is coming after the V. So already you're going into that, um, more puckered position for that as well. So, uh, when he says his, if you don't go back into such a, a wide grin, then that would help it flow through that a little bit more. Uh, easily as well. And even when he's saying favorite, you've got, you know, a pretty um, wide uh, position. So favorite, you got to get that R in there. We did a good job with hole, fishing hole. He's hitting that teeth closed position a little early. So on an L for like called, um, the tongue would be up behind the, pretty much behind the teeth, uh, called like sort of hitting the roof of the mouth, kind of just behind the front teeth. Um, and then the lips would close after that. So you're kind of going straight into the D sound and not showing the L, even though you can't really see what's happening inside the mouth so much for the tongue is if you had the um, the mouth neutrally open for that part call and it's called as well place called. So again, with the pucker, right, slightly forward, uh, and, you know, allow time for the L to get up there before closing into the D shape. See how you're getting those teeth closed on the L, which is a little bit early. I like what you did with Sparrow Lake. You did a good job getting from the S to the P and, and really popping open on that. When he's saying ever seen, um, it seems like the, the bottom lip comes up a little high at the beginning of scene you've ever seen. So it like the bottom lip comes up. It's almost more like he's saying veen because that bottom lip is getting up on top again, on top of the upper teeth. So if, if the bottom lip stayed more at this level where you can kind of see the bottom of the top teeth and go into the S from there, that would probably work a bit better because it kind of almost feels like there's a v, um, you've ever been, you know, with the way that it's that, that lip is coming up onto the upper teeth. All right. Now for the acting choices. When I was a kid, my dad once took me on a trip to his favorite fishing hole. It's a place called Sparrow Lake. It feels very rehearsed, which is perfect for what this is. That was a very good acting choice to convey the type of kind of infomercial feel um, that this has. Um, so that was a, a, a good choice. And, you know, that speaking to you, looking up constantly, kind of making eye contact back um, during the time that he is talking about his little story. When I was a kid, my dad once took me on a trip to his favorite fish. 
and the looking over at the hand while he's doing the toss just enough so that he can, uh, you know, make sure he's not going to drop it. He knows where it is in the air so he can catch it. Uh, the little toss is uh, another one of those things that um, feels like a, um, uh, a good, you know, pre-rehearsed acting choice, um, the timing of it. And, um, just that gesture being so kind of deliberate. My dad once took me on a trip to his favorite. <laughs> I love the, the way that he grabs it and he's all, yeah, you know, that, um, that the, the, the way that you, it wasn't just like a casual catch, but he was like, you know, <laughs> it was like one of those kind of gestures that just feels like it's, it's like, Hey man, um, that feels a little bit too kind of, um, Eddie Haskell enthusiastic. You probably don't know who Eddie Haskell is, but someone out there will, um, that fits really well, this kind of, you know, really rehearsed performance. Fishing hole. And same with the throw, you know, it's like got that, that kind of, um, confident, um, flavor to it a place called sparrow lake it's the most beautiful spot you've ever seen and the little nod at the end it's the most beautiful spot you've ever seen <laughs> so um overall the feel of it is just like it maintains that emotional sort of feel that you you, you know they would want for an infomercial type thing like this where he's kind of like you know, I was a kid and I came here and look at me now, I'm strong and healthy and confident, right? It's like that kind of, of selling point. Um, and, uh, you know, it, this place feels great. It's like that. And you nailed that down really, really well. Um, so I thought the uh, performance choices were bang on. And um, I like the, uh, um, you know, the, the picking up of the rock and the toss and then the skipping onto the water. Like it's all that stuff just makes so much sense uh, to use as little gestures to include. Um, and you pick just the right places for them, for them to feel that, you know, they were so rehearsed to be in that spot um, for this infomercial. And uh, so all of that stuff really fit together. Just nice. When I was a kid. My dad once took me on a trip to his favorite fishing hole. It's a place called Sparrow Lake. It's the most beautiful spot you've ever seen. Maybe on the uh, inhale, you could have, you know, you've got some really nice stuff going on here in the upper body with that, you know, moving up and, and arching the chest out and stuff. A little bit of moving up uh, in the, the hip area also would have added to that. Um, it would have really, um, engaged the entire body in that part of the performance. And I think that's something that is really important, especially in shots where you're seeing the character from the waist up, you can't see the legs. So it, it often gets forgotten that the legs are there and people might just animate what you can see from here up. Um, but it ends up just feeling more like it's a sock puppet when you, when it's done that way. And if you were to include the up and down of the hips leading into the inhale and out of the exhale, then you're going to feel that the character is more fully engaged in um, the emotion of the performance. And that's just going to tie everything together and give it that much more oomph. So keep that in mind whenever you are um, doing uh, acting, you've got gestures, even if it's like tossing the stone to uh, get a little bit of a weight shift going into it and, and even coming out of it so that it engages the rest of the body in what that gesture is doing. So the gesture isn't kind of just standing alone, but um, the character is, um, engaged in it with their entire body, even though the, the, uh, weight shift part is just a, a tiny, it's even if it's just a tiny movement, um, it just connects everything physically into the performance, which makes a big difference in how well the emotional, um, presentation reads and the audience will buy into it, uh, a lot more fully if the character is more fully engaged. So I think that is it for now. Let me just run it through one more time from the very beginning, and then I will sign off. When I was a kid, my dad once took me on a trip to his favorite fishing hole. It's a place called Sparrow Lake. It's the most beautiful spot you've ever seen. When I was a kid... Great. 
All right, Jean-Philippe, congratulations. You did a great job. And uh, hopefully there will be more to see from you on the 11 Second Club. Um, have a really good September. And uh, thanks very much for your submission. I enjoyed reviewing it. Have a great day. Bye.